Miguel, I'm, I'm curious in your meeting here, thank you. Did he ever defend himself from Scripture? No. And we, you know, as far as I was concerned, we were really looking for that. And if you read the transcript, I think that you'll uh, see that. Um, I, I stated right up front, you know, Dr. Benke, we're not here to crucify you. I said, if there's, if we're wrong, and I'm a younger, young pastor, uh, please correct me. Show me from Scripture where I'm wrong. Uh, but that didn't happen. I mean, didn't wasn't even attempted. Um, I didn't put this into my paper, and I don't know if the other ones will do that, but how has the, the overall, all the Christian churches' approach to this issue changed in history? And in other words, did Luther and those guys have to deal with this to the same degree that we do today? And, and how has that affected our Missouri Synod's position? Right. So I was wondering, you know, was this crypto Calvinism, was that a unionistic issue? Uh, and, you know, I, I, Dr. Nolan, if you can, I have a terrible time remembering the difference between the General Synod and the General Conference. But the things that were going on with the Galesburg rule and so forth, well, wasn't that dealing with unionism? Um, so, and, and I also I'd like to know, too, is, is this unionism question, is it? only a Missouri Synod phenomenon? Uh, are there no other churches in Christendom that are concerned with unionism, syncretism? Uh, but I don't know, I, don't, I forget, I can't remember where it was or who first showed it to me, but there was also a, uh, an archeological find of a Jewish synagogue, which had in beautiful mosaics, the Zodiac in the, in the floor of the, the, the uh, synagogue. So I think it's been going on for a long time. One would have to think that the churches of Germany that became Lutheran started unionistically trying to overcome some of their Catholic understandings and, and uh, methods. So, but the object then would have been to move away from it, right. not towards it, right. which would have been a big difference. But, you know, it just sort of strikes me that I guess Roman Catholicism almost has kind of a unionism built into it that why do they have all these Franciscans and Augustinians and Dominicans and Jesuits? You know, why can't they all agree on the, on the same thing? Um, but we, we find that even in scriptures too, a lot more, you know, when you, if you read the account of, the, uh, of Babel, what was the issue? All the people were one. There, there's a kind of a unionism that goes on that's not pleasing to God and in the, uh, the prophets, I think I mentioned Micaiah here. All the prophets had prophesied one thing to the king. They were all agreed, and they said, "Micaiah, come on, join us. Say the same thing as us." And Micaiah said, "I can't say anything other than what God has told me." Okay. Anyone else? Sure. Yeah, I just had a question. You were talking about that. Um, Walther quotes from the Bible. Radix that he edited, when he talks about this in the letter of Mary that I quoted. And so I went, I'm, my Latin is not very good, but I went and read Bayer and some of the Orthodox when they dealt with this issue. And they point to the Old Testament, this is what, what your comment brought, uh, the Jews, according to the Orthodox Lutherans, uh, the whole point of kosher and the rules about not mixing various types of uh, fabrics together was to uh, instill in the, people, the Jewish people the notion that you have to keep separate these things. And so it's an anti anti-humanistic idea that is kosher. This was the Orthodox Lutheran's approach on it. Yeah, by the way, I don't translate Latin very well either, even though I teach it at a certain level in our middle school. But um, you know the Bayer Compendium is being translated by Ted, May Ted Mays? email me and I'll send you what I got so far, but he's doing large chunks of it and making them available to people. In my, uh, in my brief discussions with Dr. Schultz about the uh, banking meetings and such, uh, I, can't, I can't describe 
the, uh, the look on his face and the uh, pain that the discussions that were held with Dr. Benke could not and would not, because of Dr. President Benke, center on God's Word or the Lutheran Confessions. Um, what did you talk about? And if God's Word and the Lutheran Confessions were not the, the uh, sole norm and source, what possibly could there be to discuss? Was it the Eighth Commandment? Was it methodology? Uh, was it those kind of things? Or was there some other approach that uh, well, I President think, Banky defended I think himself with? In general, it's the idea that love trumps doctrine. And yeah, you could talk about all of those things. And yes, we believe all these things. And yes, I'm a Lutheran and I believe in the confession. But you can't expect all these people to, you know, listen to all that stuff. You got to be loving. It's, you know, kind of the idea that if somebody's drowning, you don't throw them a Bible, you throw them a lifesaver. Uh, but, that, that, I mean, that's faulty reasoning, too. It's, it sounds very practical. But, uh, yeah, I mean, for the most part, uh, he just wasn't interested in talking, and they were just uh, accusing us of, you know, being unreasonable. So, so his actions by participating were loving, right. and your actions and the other people who filed false doctrine charges, your actions were unloving. Right. I mean, in in his these, mind or in his. Yeah. And we tried to make it clear to him too. I like to. I'm. I'm pretty insistent about making a distinction between. I did not file charges. I registered a complaint. And as far as I was concerned at the time, David Banky, you're my brother. I want to, my elder brother, I want to talk to you. But I have issues with this, and I don't think that they can just be ignored. Rather than, you know, it was often displayed as some kind of a litigious legal, we're suing you kind of a thing. And in my mind, that's not what I was trying to do at all. But to lead somebody to, you, we can't have love without repentance. And that's kind of what I, th I see them doing is, well, you don't have to repent. We just love each other. And, and you know, the sad thing about it as well, too, for me, and, and maybe ironic, I I'm willing to grant that, that David Benke has a real love for souls. I mean, he really wants people to be saved. I don't deny that at all. And I really have a real love for souls. And I'm, uh, you know, very saddened and, and, uh, that I want the people to be saved. So we both want souls to be saved, but we have such, uh, you know, why can't we do it together? I mean, it's just, uh, that's kind of painful in and of itself that uh, we can be at each other's throats when we kind of both want the same thing, but we have a completely different understanding of how to go about it. Like politics in America today. Um, last question, at any point in time, did Banky's previous participation in unionistic services and his being called on the carpet by President Barry and his public uh, confession and apology and promise that he would never, ever, ever do it again, did that come into play at all? Well, I certainly reminded him of that. And that's part of the reason why you know, while I had plenty of other things to do at the time, why I felt it was necessary to file a complaint um, because he had, this was, he just kept on doing it and it seemed to me somebody's got to say something and, and do something about that. And what was interesting, I think I mentioned to a couple of you before, that uh, he used this kind of excuse too. Uh, so he basically threw Dale Meyer under the bus. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, we were here uh, accusing him of, of unionism. And he said, well, why are you picking on me? Dale Meyer did the same thing in Forest Park. Why don't you file a complaint against him? And we were kind of thinking, well, okay, maybe we will. Uh, but uh, it was kind of like, well, you know, I'm not the only one doing it, so why are you picking on me? Your conversations with David Bay, he didn't center in the uh, scriptures or confessions. Um, I participated in a theology group from the Southern District. <laughs> the point of view, 
No, this was a, this was a number of years ago. Okay. We were trying to talk about Holy Communion and whether or not uh, there's a practice of Holy Communion going on. And uh, when I got in the group, I realized I was one end of the spectrum. And in that group, we were to come up with a report to the district president. However, when we got into our discussions, we weren't really getting anywhere with this, so I suggested that perhaps we should just go back to the confessions, read Article 7 of the Formula of Concord, so we have a place to begin in our unity. I was immediately uh, accused <clears throat> of wanting to do an inquisition. And, uh, and then in trying to say, well, then let's just determine what our terms are so we're speaking the same terms. We couldn't get anywhere with that. We never accomplished the purpose for which we got together. And I learned, we're not going to change them. They're, if they're not willing to talk about what we have in unity in the confessions and the scriptures, it's done. Yeah, well, that's you know really the experience that Luther had at Marburg, isn't it? And and when that was all over with, uh, wasn't it there that Luther said, "Du hast an anderer Geist" to Zwingli, you have a different spirit. Well, then, okay, so I'll lay it on the table. Then, how are our district and synodical communion services not unionistic or syncretistic? I don't, I, don't I don't attend to district. Yeah. Me. So maybe, um, you know, you can't, like you said in your paper, you said it wonderfully. You know, you can't argue with emotion. Oftentimes, the appeal to love is an emotional thing. More than the rational, we're looking at what scripture actually teaches us, what true love is, which are so actually uh, stating that it is a problem. The whole thing, I think the Synod as a whole has uh, failed David Bainey and to bring him to repentance. That's our brother. But that's the thing, there, you know, repentance and the gospel, there's no surefire way of doing it. You can preach repentance, but there's no guarantee that people are going to repent. Yeah. That's not that, you know, we, we still haven't answered the crux te allegorum. Why are some people saved and not others? You know, why do some people understand that unionism isn't right and others do? I don't know. But and, you know, I've already spoken more than my fair share, but I really wanted to emphasize that, you know, the word unionism and concord kind of have similar ideas, but completely different methods, if you will. And, uh, you know, coming to conferences like these and, and working to have a common confession, I think is the best way to address unionism than some of these other things. We need to stand together, say the same thing, continue to proclaim God's word in the confessions exact, exactly as you're saying, and then let God do his work. I can't make those things ultimately happen. Yeah, you're right. And so uh, thank you for standing up the way you did. Uh, that took a lot of courage. You mm -hmm. know that was too good. You did it for the right reasons. Now, when we're all walking around with marks, we know that. And that's just the nature of what we do as those who are led into the truth of God. So, but thank you. And uh, the last thing would be, I think unity is more about discovering that within one another. More than we can actually create it. We have to find where is the word being kept? And how can we keep it together and stay strong? Together? That's a good point. You know, some people, we can't create unity. God provides it. And so, you know, some people say that you create unity by coming to communion together. And we say, no, the unity has to come first. Uh, in that common confession of faith. It's not created by the Lord's Supper. It's a statement of common confession. Now, Brother Joel, I want to commend you for how you handled that whole thing. Uh, and it brought to mind as you were talking, uh, the new edition of Walter's Pastoral Theology, uh, published by CPH, has much, all the sections are much longer. The one I noticed in particular was the chapter on fraternal admonition. And the fraternal admonition in the Lutheran News version is very short because it cuts out all the Orthodox fathers. In the CPH edition, it's all that stuff. And I read through it again, I thought, 
well, we really lost the gift of doing this. And the Orthodox Fathers all knew this is how we treat his brother. So I commend you because you did it, even though you didn't know that's our heritage. That's the way that you did well, it. Well, Slovak. I figured that's why this is a free conference. You let anybody in here, but even Slovaks. Um, but kind of along those lines, I had asked Dr. Nagel once, Dr. Nagel, when do you excommunicate somebody? Uh, you know, in the congregation, but that might also have something to say about a church body as well. And uh, his uh, interesting comment, which, you know, his, he often had short things that made me think for years afterwards, but Dr. Nagel, when do you excommunicate somebody? He says, when they tell you to go to hell. So don't be defensive or apologetic about these things and don't be timid. I mean, when you go to a convention, Speak the truth forthrightly, okay? Not necessarily passionately, but just speak the truth in love and, and don't water it down at all. And keep on doing that again and again and again. And, you know, while they're still listening, I mean, that's one, one, probably the only reason why I'm still in the Missouri Synod is, as far as the doctrine is concerned, it's, it's the only church I know that, that does this. But as far as the practices are concerned, uh, you know, Sasse talks about, and he wrote a letter, Hermann Preuss, a friend of his in Germany, and was complaining about the president, that the, the president of the seminary was at odds with the doctrine of you know, the, uh, well, actually the president of the, the, the synod at that time. And uh, uh, Sasse didn't last long. He, he was only at the St. Louis Seminary about four months. People didn't want him to be there, and so he moved on to Australia. But um, we've got to... Speak the truth in love and, and get other people. You know, I'm waiting for somebody to file a complaint against me. Okay, I'm ready. I'm going to make the good confession. Give me a platform and an opportunity to put on the record these things. And maybe you can too.